Welcome everyone to the Carter Center's Forum on Women Roundtable series. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our esteemed colleagues who have a lot to say about the current Iran deal and its implications for the people of Iran, as well as insight on the history of the impact of sanctions and where we might go from here. Um, I want to uh, move forward and um, introduce Ali Garib, who is a journalist and has written extensively on the topic of U.S. policy and the Iran, um, the policy with regards to Iran and uh, sanctions, as well as the nuclear uh, deal. Susan DiMaggio is with the New America Foundation, and she has worked extensively on the issue. And also we have Suzanne Tahmasebi here, who is from the uh, International Civil Society Action Network. Thank you all for being here. Pleasure to be here. And I want to dive right in. We will have Omad, Omid uh, as well, uh, Memarian, joining us uh, soon, uh, we hope. Thank you very much. Um, the administration and Congress claim that sanctions brought Iran to the no negotiating table, and which we've seen this last week has started to uh, uh, bring about some change, we hope, and laying the ground for recent, this recent agreement on the nuclear program. While this might be accurate, many don't understand the real consequences of sanctions policy. There has been a strong push by some in the U.S. to maintain the sanctions, even while Iran is taking significant steps to dismantle its capacity to build nuclear weapons. Our goal within this hour is to understand how sanctions impact Iranian society, including hardline anti-Western factions, as well as the reformers and democratic forces inside the country. What is the real price of sanctions, we are asking. So, Suzanne, to start, uh, what have the role of sanctions been uh, in U.S.-Iran policy uh, in recent years? Well, thanks again for organizing this. I'm happy to be a part of it. Let me just focus my brief answer on uh, the Obama administration. If you recall, when Senator Barack Obama was a presidential candidate in 2007, he said he would engage aggressively in personal diplomacy with Iran if he was elected and would offer economic inducements, particularly if Iran cooperated on its nuclear program, i.e. sanctions relief. Uh, fast forward to his January 2009 inauguration speech, when he famously said he would extend a hand to so-called rogue states if they were willing to unclench their fists. He didn't mention Iran by name, but we all knew who he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the first term of the administration, it was a, they were pursuing a dual track policy is what they say towards Iran, a pressure track on one hand and a diplomatic track on the other. Um, throughout this first term, the emphasis was on sanctions and coercive measures, uh, more coercion, methodically building a sanctions regime against Iran, very, very little engagement. Uh, and uh, he pursued international sanctions that were far harsher than his predecessors. So in a nutshell, I would say the economic sanctions uh, for um, to some extent have been effective. And I hedge this, I'll say why later. Um, uh, this is because they were applied multilaterally by an international coalition of friends, allies, and partners. Uh, what the sanctions did accomplish we could debate this, but I would say they blocked Iran's efforts to modernize its military. They weakened the economy, obviously. They possibly slowed the expansion of Iran's nuclear program. And they helped add momentum within the existing framework for nuclear negotiations. Uh, but the fact remains that um, although it may have slowed the nuclear, uh, the nuclear program, they did not stop the advancement of Iran's nuclear program. In 2003, Iran had 164 centrifuges. Uh, today, uh, prior to the um, interim agreement, they have 19,000 centrifuges. When uh, President Obama took office, they had 1,000 kilograms of enriched uranium. Today, prior to the interim agreement, they had 12,000 kilograms. Uh, and I know other uh, panelists will talk about this, but I would contend they have not improved Iran's human rights practices. In fact, they may have empowered anti-reform factions. And the fact is, is that efforts to isolate Iran have not 
uh, reduce its influence in the region. Now, if we turn our attention to the second term, there was a strategic decision to strengthen the diplomatic track in order to seize the opportunity created by the pressure track. So this was the robust negotiation track that included direct bilateral talks, which were done secretly at first. And of course, since then, uh, we've seen a remarkable period of sustained diplomatic engagement between Washington and, and Tehran through the P5 plus one talks. This started with the secret negotiations that began in 2012, continued through the interim agreement, which was reached in November 2013, uh, and then through the framework agreement, which was just reached earlier this month in Switzerland. So sanctions played an important role in getting us to where we are today. But I would also contend um, that it wasn't sanctions alone that brought Iran to the table. That's the conventional wisdom, and that's what the policymakers say. say. But in fact, also, you, the US turn away from regime change in Iran as a strategic objective has been dropped. Uh, that has helped. Um, also, the administration's uh, relaying to the uh, Iranians that it was prepared to accept Iran having its peaceful nuclear capability, including a uh, enrichment program on its soil. I think just as much as anything brought Iran, Iran to the table. Um, and then we have to also throw in the disa disastrous management of the Iranian economy by Ahmadinejad played a role too. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more complex picture than just saying sanctions brought Iran to the table. I'll right. stop there. Thank you for that overview, very informative. Before we continue with our questions and discussion, I want to uh, welcome Omid Mamarian to the conversation. Thank you for joining us. Omid is a journalist as well and human rights defender who's written extensively on this topic, including for The Daily Beast. Uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So I want to continue with a question for uh, Ali. There has historically been a push for sanctions from the American right. And we've seen how they have uh, potentially positive impacts in terms of as, as an incentive to negotiate. But there's also uh, certain negative impacts, which we'll get into more, more in, um, as we continue the conversation. So this push for sanctions has also uh, included a sort of general disposition as in opposed to diplomacy and a deal with Iran. And this has most uh, recently and notoriously been illustrated by the letter uh, from Tom Cotton and other uh, U.S. congressmen and diplomats, uh, congressmen and senators to Iran's leaders. How does this discourse in the U.S. impact the ability to implement measured sanctions that perhaps target only the nefarious activities uh, that uh, restrict our ability to negotiate a deal and spare broader society from exacerbated impacts of sanctions? Well, as you said, for some of the impacts on sanctions, you know, I mean, I think that there are other panelists here, uh, uh, particularly Susan and Omid, but also Suzanne, who have better contacts in Iran and understand the economics of it better there, and they can speak to that. But on the American political scene, you know, the people who design these sanctions and, uh, and impose them, they're, they're, they're legislatively imposed by the Congress, and that's sort of a, a readout of foreign pol policy hardliners. It has been on many issues over time, and for a lot of these characters, you know, Tom Cotton is just the latest in a long string of them. There can never be enough sanctions imposed on a, on a on, you know, what they would consider an enemy nation, irrespective of the damage it might do to the, to the people of that country. And all you have to do is look at Iraq, which was under intense sanctions throughout the 1990s, you know, to the great detriment of, of uh, the Iraqi populace. Some, you know, 350,000 young people and children died as a result of sanctions, according to studies. The infant mortality rate went up threefold within a decade. Uh, because of malnourishment and, and medicines, and you know, it's, it's easy to say that some of those were caused by Saddam Hussein's own policies, which is true, just like some of the, as Suzanne was saying, some of the economic conditions in Iran were exacerbated by uh, mismanagement under Ahmadinejad's presidency. But the fact is, is that these, uh, the sanctions made it a lot harder, and I'm sure this is, this is something other families will get into too. Uh, they also create opportunities for corruption among the party's elites, I'm sorry, among the, 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 
foreign countries they lead to are usually the same people that we're trying to oppose. Mm -hmm. This would be in the case of Iraq, Saddam Hussein's kind of crony government, and in Iran, the, uh, the Islamic Republic's government and its various apparatchiks and operatives, and especially the hardliners that are closest to the leadership. Uh, those people can often benefit from, uh, because of whatever is slipping by through the sanctions regime often goes through them, and it creates opportunities for those people to enrich themselves, even as the sanctions tend to really bite the general population of these countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting parallels to Iraq, which we know suffered under a sanctions regime for a long time. And so as we potentially look forward to change with regards to our relations with Iran, um, we definitely want to hear more, and I want to address this question to Omid, uh, about how sanctions have impacted both these power balances within the country, uh, between reformers and conservatives, between different parts of the regime, and also what the implications have been for human rights and reform at the civil society level and for average Iranians. I believe that um, uh, sanctions have, have been devastating for elements of change. Um, the middle class in Iran, small businesses, the students, the reform movement, Iran's independent society organizations, and all those who um, seek democratic change in Iran. Sanctions, um, you know, provided a tools for hardliners over the past years to suppress the middle class, both politically and economically, as Iran's economy is vastly under the control of the state, and as those who do not have the power of the state, both the chief are most and worst. Um, also, uh, over the past few years, uh, uh, you know, hardliners, the revolutionary guards, and uh, all those uh, institutions that are under the control of the city leader, um, they have used the uh, threat uh, of uh, military action uh, of sanctions as an excuse to push back those uh, reformist um, elements, those uh, uh, activists who seek more engagement with the world, to the United States, mm -hmm. to, 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 to the EU countries, uh, those who push for peaceful dem uh, uh, domestic change. Uh, by saying that uh, what they are after spreads into the hands of the enemy, as mm -hmm. the Supreme Leader always says. Which in Iran uh, is the United States mission. Um, we have seen how um, the threat of military action over the past few years, sanctions, uh, um, have uh, played into the hand of um, the Iran intelligence, uh, the Revolutionary Guard intelligence, how they have uh, shut down any public debate on the issue of sanctions itself. Iran's nuclear program and other issues of public interest. And they have been able to use this to dominate their narrative uh, regarding all these issues. So nobody can object them, nobody can criticize them, and if somebody criticizes them, they consequences. And uh, to a large extent, you can say that uh, over the past few years, uh, uh, with, 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 with all these um, uh, sanctions and uh, the threat of nuclear action against Iran, uh, uh, regarding the Mr. program, it has uh, played into the hand of hardliners and uh, basically have made, has uh, made the environment for uh, Iran's uh, civil society um, uh, very uh, depressing and very difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an important implication of these policies that I'm not sure that our policymakers in the U.S. and the international community are always thinking about as much as they should, though there's obviously voices like your own who are articulating this uh, well. So we want to continue to focus a little bit more on the impact of sanctions, and I want to go to Suzanne and ask you, have the sanctions hurt ordinary Iranians, especially women and vulnerable groups, and how has civil society reacted in the face of sanctions and their impact in the country? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I want to go back even to um, several years before this. In, um, during the 9-1-1 um, uh, attacks in the U.S., I think I, I want to point, point to this because I just, I just want to uh, give you a sense of how the Iranian public reacted to the, to the sanctions. Um, in, in the region, Iran was the only country where people spontaneously went out into the streets, ordinary citizens, and expressed their sorrow for what happened mm. and their solidarity mm -hmm. with the American public. Right? Mm. 
you know, I, I want to put, I want to point to that because I think it's still very relevant, despite the fact that the government, the Iranian government and the U.S. government haven't had relations for a very long time, and there's been this constant threat of war, and or uh, in the best case scenario, no war, but also no peace. We see an Iranian public that is very eager to be part of the international community. They don't want war. They don't want isolation. And we see that you know that that despite the rhetoric of some of the hardliners within the government, the Iranian public wants to have relations with, with the West and also with the U.S. And I think it's very important to point, point this out. What has happened in the last several years, especially with the, with the uh, strengthening of sanctions, I want to point out that Iran has been sanctioned for 30 years. It's not a new mm -hmm. thing for the Iranians. But uh, what the sanctions that actually happened after 2010 um, they're often referred to as crippling sanctions, and they really are crippling, but they're more crippling for Iranian, ordinary Iranians than anybody else. People who don't have access to power, people who can't cross borders, people who can't, don't have bank accounts in other countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, um, oftentimes, I think um, Americans, especially the international community, talk about how they want to pressure the Iranian government. Um, but what they've actually done is to pressure the Iranian public. And I think... Um, the biggest result of the sanctions on the public has been the worsening of the economy. Albeit, I, I, I do accept that you know the policies of Ahmadinejad's period on the economic policies were, were um, um, uh, very very poor and they they you know, they impacted the economy negatively. But also, we could see very clear impacts of sanctions on the economy. For example, every time a new round of sanctions were introduced, you would see the value of the real falling considerably, and it was. You know, people were constantly waiting for the next for the next shoe to drop, right? Um, along with that, there was constantly a threat of war, um, especially during the Ahmadinejad period, because there was this um, uh, lack of desire to um, engage in any negotiations or peace with, with the international community. So they could see the tensions rising. And it's this constant state of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, it, it, it's a constant state of limbo for Iranian society. So I think, and with the worsening economic situation, I think that gives you a sense of how Iranians have lived for the last five years. Um, at the same time, I think that despite the fact that they call these sanctions targeted sanctions, they're not targeted sanctions mm -hmm. because they target um, the banking system. This is the, is, is the most problematic part of the sanctions. They target the banking system, which means that the entire Iranian society, all the entire country, is actually to be treated as a terrorist state. There can be no transactions with anybody outside the country. Um, and that's created serious problems on humanitarian issues, including medicine. And um, officials will say that you know there, there is no sanctions on medicine. But if you can't pay for medicine, then it, there, there are sanctions on medicine. And even when I was in Iran in 2010, with the initial sanctions, the shipping sanctions, we could see that some of the medicines were not you know, accessible. We couldn't find imported medicines. Mm -hmm. I had this experience. So, mm -hmm. Situation got worse and worse. There were sanctions on um, on gasoline, which meant Iranians had to produce their own gasoline, and they, they didn't have uh, the capacity to do it. So this impacted very severely the air quality in big cities like mm -hmm. Tehran. Um, also, we saw a sort of a total decimation of the of the private sector. It's the, the Iranian private sector is a very you know it's a very weak and small sector, and we really saw the economic hardships felt by them significantly and uh, you know falling to the side and, and, and um, of, of small businesses that hire you know that both hire people but you know that they also they also point to reform right if you have a business sector you have the possibility for reform so while the small business sector got weakened and small businesses went out of you know went out of business the Sepah, the revolutionary guards actually had more power and more um uh, hold of of, of of income generating companies, mm -hmm. right? So there was this there was this shift, um, and I want to say also that civil society from the start has been expressing their um, uh, disillusion with these sanctions and their objection to these mm -hmm. sanctions because they put the most pressure on vulnerable groups, including women, um, Afghan refugees, for example. And we did a at ICANN, we did a brief on the urging of our counterparts in Iran, so the Iranian counterparts, looking at the impact of sanctions on ordinary um, citizens. But um, the sanctions have also had serious impact on civil society. I think for many of the same reasons that they've impacted the regular population, if you're in a state of limbo, if you're just working to survive, 
you know, if you are in survival mode, it becomes very difficult to focus on creating change. Mm -hmm. Economic hardship has hurt Iranian civil society, I think, considerably, because Iranian civil society is a volunteer sector. It's not, it doesn't get funding. So for people to be involved in civil society, they have to have some level of economic um, uh, security. And when you don't have that economic security, then civil society also falls below that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that picture. We're hoping that with the new framework that's been reached, perhaps we'll see some opening of the situation in the coming uh, while. So I want to uh, move to that discussion now and we'll come back to this issue of civil society and uh, the impacts and what we might see in terms of flourishing it, should the sanctions be uh, removed or lifted. Um, so Suzanne, I want to go back to you and ask you to describe what have the political dynamics been in Iran with regards to these recent nuclear negotiations? Sure, I'll focus on the reaction to the nuclear framework agreement, which was reached on April 2nd mm -hmm. in Switzerland. Uh, so we see many analysts have viewed uh, the Supreme Leader's speech in reaction to the agreement as typically harsh, uh, a hardline reaction, as he is well known to give. Uh, he insisted that sanctions uh, must all be completely removed on the day of the agreement. And he also mm -hmm. warned that one must absolutely not allow infiltration of the security and defense realm uh, on the pretext of inspections. So these were the two key issues he hit upon was san immediate sanctions relief and drawing a red line on inspections, I would say, for military sites, uh, which we know are both problematic issues. Interestingly, he went on to say that some uh, that details of the negotiations are supervised by the leader, uh, but he said that this was not accurate. Uh, in fact, he insisted that uh, President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif play a role. Now, you can interpret this as he was deflecting blame in case of a failure, or he was actually empowering his negotiating team. My read of the speech is that he was posturing to strengthen uh, Iran's negotiating position as they head into the home stretch. Uh, the last time there was a major um, negotiation uh, in this series, you'll recall he drew a red line calling for $190,000 uh, 190, uh, swoos uh, for the capacity of the enrichment program, and it looks like he's ended up with far less than that. Um, so a lot of it's huffing and puffing. Also, according to some of my Persian-speaking friends, uh, they said his, they listened to the speech and said his tone was as soft as they have heard. Uh, also important is, uh, to me, the most important part of the speech was for the first time, I think, he indicated that if the negotiations led to a successful outcome, uh, he would agree to uh, possibly opening the way for further dialogue on other issues with the West and the United States. Uh, I think it's also important to point out that support uh, came from all corners of Iran. And, uh, the leaders of Friday prayers across Iran uh, supported the negotiations, supported the negotiators. Uh, we also heard support from the commander of the Revolutionary Guard, Jafari, and the Speaker of the uh, Parliament, Ali Larjani, and so forth. Um, so some of the opponents to the deal, either here in Washington or elsewhere, base their opposition on the assumption that Hamani will never accept the deal. Uh, but I don't think that that's the case. Um, even prior to the Lausanne framework and since, I think we've been seeing clear signs that um, there's a coalescing around the coming nuclear deal uh, and in Iran. And uh, we see that with Hamani's express support for Rouhani and the negotiators. So I would call mm -hmm. it an enforced discipline across Iran's political system in support of the negotiation, keeping hardline opponents uh, to a deal in check. That doesn't mean there, that there isn't that opposition. There is strong opposition. Uh, now, this forced enforced discipline, uh, this dynamic could quickly change, particularly if it becomes apparent that uh, President Obama can't deliver on sanctions relief or that the U.S. Congress is uh, undermining that process. Uh, in the case of President Rouhani, following the framework agreement, he gave an address to the nation uh, 
We emphasize uh, Iran's commitment to fulfill its com uh, com obligations, uh, which, by the way, Iran has been doing since the interim agreement. Uh, he also he, uh, noted um, that an agreement could lead to con more constructive engagement uh, and also uh, greater engagement in foreign relations. Uh, this was an important, um, uh, I would say, win for Rouhani. It, it has been 18 months since the famous phone call between him and President Obama, and he needs to show some progress. Now, looking ahead, um, the deal itself, I think there's some inherent risks for the Iranians. The uncertainty vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Congress, I think, is a big concern. Also, if we look ahead to the next administration after President Obama, that's important because it will be the task of the next president to work with Congress to permanently lift the sanctions. Uh, president Obama will have waiver authority, but we don't expect the sanctions to be permanent li permanently lifted, many of them, until after he leaves office. And then, of course, um, the, the question that fascinates me the most are the internal risks for uh, Iran's elites. Um, if uh, indeed a sanction, uh, the, the deal is a success, uh, how will uh, the leadership and manage uh, the, the expectations of the people of Iran and all, all, all that this deal um, I would and should, uh, and I think that's the question uh, that um, uh, fascinates me endlessly, and I, I think there are many answers to it, but I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, should we, we self-moderate? Well, sorry, I... Okay. Am I... Back here, thanks, sorry, I think that we were having a connection issue. Um, so thank you, Suzanne. I wanted to add, uh, ask Ali if you had anything to add from the US side of the, of the equation. I know a lot of the discussion here has been about whether Iran can be a trusted party in the negotiations and within a deal, and that the terms of the deal should be much tougher. And from the U.S. perspective, I wonder if you could add um, to this picture in terms of whether there should be engagement with Iran and can Iran be trusted to hold up its end of the bargain, although Suzanne's already um, really uh, you know, illustrated how this is also a concern, obviously, for Iranians with regards to the U.S. So if you could add to that picture from the U.S. perspective, Ali. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in some respects, what... Uh, what, what uh, Suzanne was talking about about the uh, enforced discipline that Khamenei is able to exert inside Iran is really sort of the opposite of the situation we have here, where Congress is able to, to kind of uh, uh, run amok on on whatever agreements Obama is making. I mean, we mentioned the Tom Cotton letter going behind the back of the president and encouraging a foreign government not to make a diplomatic agreement with the United States. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, last week here we had a, or this week we had a, a, a bill come out of a committee in the Senate that looks like it's going to give Congress a review over any prospective nuclear agreement that, that comes out of the, the June deadline. And, uh, and you know, the, the bill isn't as harmful as it could have been. Uh, one of the things that they tried to do was to broaden the terms beyond the scope of an actual nuclear agreement to insert provisions on, for example, uh, on Iran not supporting terrorism and in another proposed amendment that never got introduced by a Republican presidential candidate, Marco Rubio, he wanted to include uh, uh, Israel's recognition as a condition for mm -hmm. for uh, Iran to join the, um, for Iran to, to sign an agreement. And so, so some of those things are efforts to kill deals, but, but Congress is going to be able to a great extent uh, continue to do this, try and, try and throw, uh, throw wrenches in the gears of, of nuclear diplomacy. Now, with this bill coming out of committee, it violates what was sort of a tacit agreement between the two sides that, that neither would let their parliaments interfere with talks too much. The Iranians have largely held to this because of the more uh, uh, dictatorial aspects where kind of what the Supreme Leader says goes and he can keep his hardliners in check. But Obama doesn't have as easy a time of that in Congress. 
And there are people who, in Congress who will try and will have some limited power to, to, to kill a deal. And these are people who, you know, don't, you know, might, might feign caring about the human rights situation in Iran, but don't always do that. You know, uh, Susan talked earlier about the, uh, the, the sanctions on, on medicines that have really um, hurt people in Iran. And you know that that, that there's there and, and more that you said before that you know maybe the uh, the policymakers in Washington should have considered these ill humanitarian effects of their of their sanctions. Well, the truth is, in some cases, they did consider them. Uh, Mark Kirk, who's a senator from Illinois, a Republican, has been the architect of a lot of these sanctions measures. The, the central bank sanctions that Sen talked about, um, he introduced those, and it passed 100 to nothing in the Senate. And Mark Kirk has said publicly that he doesn't mind taking food out of the mouths of ordinary Iranians in order to punish the government, which, you know, uh, considering that the, the, the dictatorial aspects of the regime is, is uh, it seems like just gratuitous, gratuitous punishment of this population. And I think that we're going to see um, efforts like that continue. I don't, I don't want to belabor the Iraq comparison, but these same people who are pushing these sanctions now we're never satisfied with the sanctions regime on Iraq, as terrible as it got. And eventually we saw the same characters who were leading that push for sanctions lead the push for war in the early 2000s after 9-11. And uh, these guys are still in power on the Hill, and they're going to keep pushing it. And that's a much bigger question mark than whether Khamenei can keep his large hardliners in check, is whether the uh, whether the American president, whether it's Obama or in, or in the next term, uh, Hillary Clinton or whomever her Republican challenger will be if they win, whether they can keep Congress in check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really uh, important point, and um, I want to continue to discuss the implications for the Iranian public because I think that's really uh, what we uh, want to focus on here today. There's been a lot of discussion of political implications, and we want to be sure that the the people are not lost in in that mix. And so I want to continue with Suzanne, uh, Susan and tell, ask, what does the Iranian public, especially those groups you've been engaged with, civil society groups on the ground, uh, think about the deal specifically, uh, the prospect for a deal and what that might mean in terms of uh, engagement and an opening of relations with the West? Yeah, just um, to go back to what I said before, I want to reiterate that one of the main uh, voices against the possibility of war and against sanctions from Iran has consistently been civil society groups. Mm -hmm. Even several um, of the political prisoners, they wrote statements from inside prison condemning the sanctions, condemning the possibility of war, and maybe um, bringing, trying to bring the attention of the international community towards um, the path that the Iranians have chosen, which is the path towards reform um, to move forward. Um, and many people inside of Iran, and you know, I think also uh, many of my colleagues have expressed that they feel that these sanctions are not, they, they're intended more than anything to punish the Iranian public as a way to um, sort of uh, push them to the brink so that they pour out into the streets of a different, of a course of a different nature, not the nature of coming out into the streets and asking for democratic rights, uh, you know, where it's a much more sophisticated and a peaceful and civil kind of protest and, 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 um, uh, and perhaps uh, demand, but really coming into the streets because economically they're so um, strapped that they want to come and overthrow the government. And, um, and you know, myself included, I think many people are uh, nervous about that scenario. Obviously, you don't want to see the fabric of Iranian society destroyed at that level. It's never proven to be a positive thing. You can look at countries like you know, Syria, Iraq, all of these countries who've had similar experiences, and we don't see positive, um, a, a positive result, right? Even Libya, for example, right? Um, so, um, you know, so they've consistently stressed the need for civil engagement, civil approach to reform, and we see that as you know, as people turned out to vote again after you know a very difficult experience in 2009, where they just felt like they you know their votes weren't counted. They turned out to vote because they they seem to consistently side on the side of um, uh, of political you know political participation and a civil process for change. 
Um, that being said, I just want to say that um, it's important to keep in mind that now that there are relations, there's still, I mean, there, there are possibilities for relations relations. There's still many concerns on the part of civil society and on the part of public. Obviously, one of the main things the public is looking for is economic relief, right? Um, uh, they feel that the sanctions have, have, have uh, has, uh, pressured Iran's economy, so they want economic relief. The, business, the small business sector is looking for a recovery. Uh, people are looking for jobs, but they're also mm -hmm. looking to be engaged with the international community. This is very important for them. Um, and to be seen not as a pariah state, this is incredibly important. And you know, to be seen, we saw this during the reform period, during Pakistan, where people were very happy about the fact that the world is looking at them um, in positive light. So they do want to see that. And for civil society, it's also important because they think that this might be an opportunity for them to be engaged as well. They have been completely isolated over the last few years, really for 30 some years, but especially the last few years. And they want they want that re engagement. So re engaging with Iran for them means um, that there's possibility for them to re engage. But they are also nervous about um, about the possibility. Will the government take action to improve uh, um, the space for civil society to operate? Um, will they take action to improve human rights? Will they, you know, or will it clamp down on on um, uh, the um, civil society inside the country, or people who depend politically. Um, the, so there is there is this fear. I mean, both. But I think the most important thing is that they think that if the economic pressures were were relieved a little bit, civil society can become a little more more active and take have a stronger voice in making demands within within Iran on issues, national issues and human rights issues. Mm -hmm. At the same time. Um, it's important to stress that if there's going to be normalization of relations, whether it's with the U.S. or with the West or the Europeans, that that normalization of relations can't only be at the political and at the economic level. That it needs to be as most, at all levels. It needs to be on human rights. It needs to be on civil society. It needs to be engaging with academia. So this is also something that I see a lot of our um, uh, colleagues inside of Iran and you know outside also stressing that normalization needs to be at multiple levels. Engagement needs to be at multiple levels. We need to engage not only politically and economically. Um, we're not going to have positive results if it's only at those two levels. We need to engage civil society. We need to engage academia. We need to, you know, there needs to be cooperation on human rights and other issues. And um, for me, one one thing that makes me a little bit nervous about um, Iran is actually the West's policies towards the region as a whole. That I don't see the region using. The West's policies demanding um, the region to more, move towards a more democratic um, uh, model where human rights are um, respected. And I'm afraid that that might be extended to Iran, but hopefully um, that won't be the case if we can have an active civil society that makes demands. Well, I, uh, I had another question for Omid, but it seems that we have lost him. So I'm going to open it to all three of you. And um, I wanted to ask, whether you think that this deal, should it be uh, confirmed, oh, Omid is back. So this question uh, I would like to address to you, Omid, and then I'll have the others chime in as well. Do you think that this deal, you know, should it go forward and be formalized and completed, will help political reform and human rights uh, uh, developments in Iran? And in what ways? I think it depends on a number of different factors. Um, uh, first and foremost is the government's commitment, Hassan Rouhani's government's commitment to respect human rights and act on its promises. Uh, Hassan Rouhani came to power based on a platform that uh, was focused uh, on human rights uh, improvement. He, uh, for two years, uh, but you know, he has been silent and he has put all his uh, apples in the nuclear basket and uh, hasn't done much uh, on the promised like the release of three dissidents, Mi Hossein, Sabi, Mekhi, Sharuk, and Zahar, and Abbas. He publicly said that you know, they will be released once uh, he's uh, elected. Or the release of um, um, the prisoners uh, uh, and uh, most social and social freedom, association freedom and all that. Um, even though there is a vast uh, public demand uh, regarding all these issues. So I think that's very uh, important to see like how the government changes its, its approach once the deal is this time. Uh, in the coming months, um, uh, once uh, the deal appears to be a success, I believe Rouhani 
you feel more pressure in the um, and uh, to act uh, upon these promises and it, um, the environment will put him in a very difficult situation. Um, we have at uh, the next parliamentary election next year and he needs his constituents to support him to make sure that the next parliament um, is, you know, you know, we have more pro-government uh, parliamentary uh, next time. Uh, to support the uh, policies of Rouhani. Uh, so if Rouhani doesn't act on his promises, he's, he's going to jeopardize uh, uh, this chance. Uh, it's going to be difficult for Rouhani to um, implement his policies uh, in, 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 in the few years. Also, I think the role of international community is very significant in the post deal era. You have to see how much the EU and the US are really to keep supporting the Iranian society, both inside the country and outside. We have to see um, that they keep the keep Iran, even when they are open in international forums um, or not, and see whether they are um, able to, as they have more communication with the Iranians, uh, um, uh, whether they uh, raise human rights issues with them when they meet with them or not. Um, in general, I believe that the uh, uh, public in Iran, uh, there's a perception that once the deal is, uh, is, uh, is signed, um, there will be more, more open space for people to discuss issues and more uh, freedom. And they um, believe that uh, they, uh, they, will, they will face a, a much better, better situation. I also believe that you know, such a deal should not only uh, it should not be seen as um, uh, will not be seen as, uh, 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 you know, we'll, ha we'll have uh, um, uh, uh, people inside Iran to engage uh, uh, with, with the international community more, and that's uh, going to cover the civil society, which is good for the human rights uh, uh, community. Uh, Iran's leader has said repeatedly that uh, the deal is just about Iran's nuclear program, and that should stay the same. I believe that. Uh, um, the international community should not minimize its effort uh, to um, deal with Iran's human rights issue and, you know, and raise its voice in uh, uh, um, international forums and also in communication with Iranian officials. Also, I uh, hope that the deal, uh, many people actually believe in Iran, uh, hope the deal opens, the, opens up their space. Uh, once the deal is signed, um, the Iranian government should not use, as I said, uh, the excuse of foreign uh, threats to press the public opinion on uh, major issues, and also the government has to face, uh, more importantly, has to face uh, serious crises um, it's suffering from domestic and international that are caused by mismanagement, corruption, and all those factors. So that's going to be, um, that's going to take a lot of time off it. Uh, all these will contribute to an environment that the civil society will have a chance to empower and flourish and play a more important role in the public sphere. However, there are people who are suspicious and you know, cynical and that um, hardliners um, in the post deal era, hardliners uh, will pressure uh, more, uh, uh, pressure uh, the uh, civil society more and to make sure that you know they control the public sphere and you know, the narratives are um, dom dominant, and that might um, that that then Iranian system might face more challenges in the coming months. But it also depends on uh, Rouhani's reaction to hardliners. It, so it depends on how he's uh, forceful and how he's determined to uh, fulfill his promises and to make sure that human rights violators. Um, are in check. Thank you. Well, that certainly paints a, a hopeful but also complex picture of the po uh, potential post-sanctions um, context. And I, I want to continue with that for, for our closing remarks in the last few minutes that we have, a uh, quarter of an hour. And I wonder if each of you could spend a couple of minutes just describing, should the deal be finalized and we uh, ha see the lifting of sanctions over the next several uh, years and uh, a state where we can restore relations with Iran in all areas of life, I'm wondering if you could 
tell us what your greatest hope would be for that post-sanctions, uh, post-deal uh, context and the relationship between the West and specifically the U.S. and Iran. And in particular, what can the public in the U.S. or, the, or other Western countries do, whether it's civil society actors uh, or uh, average citizens, private sector uh, actors, what can can we do to help ensure that, as Omid described, um, that this transformed context actually has depth to it and that we can start to restore relations in all areas of life with Iran, not just politically. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe each of you could take uh, a minute or two to just describe what you imagine for uh, a future with Iran without sanctions. Perhaps Susan could start? Susan or Suzanne? Suzanne could start. <laughs> okay, so very quickly, uh, let me just state the obvious that if there is a successful nuclear deal and things proceed well, um, there's no question that it will help to strengthen the hands of uh, the Rouhani administration and the people around him. Uh, it's important to remember there is an uh, election in the parliament coming up in Iran next year. And then, of course, after that, there will be a, uh, pres another presidential election. Will Mr. Rouhani get um, uh, reelected? Will uh, someone else take his place? Would a hard line move in? I think if a deal is reached, uh, this group of politicians and decision makers doesn't guarantee them success, but I think it, it strengthens their position for sure. Um, beyond that, looking ahead in the U.S.-Iran relations, uh, what I would advise the Obama administration once a deal is reached is to quietly but assertively pursue uh, a diplomatic engagement on other issues with Iran, um, particularly those issues where the U.S. and Iran have common interests. I wouldn't call them low-hanging fruit because nothing in the, this relationship is easy, but perhaps something like Afghanistan, where the common interests are quite evident. Uh, the support of the new unity government, maintaining territorial integrity, um, and so forth. Uh, another might be um, combating ISIS, uh, and if full-on outright cooperation is, um, is, is possible, at the minimum, some coordination now that both our militaries are operating in the same theater. Uh, but beyond these security political issues, uh, my sincere hope would be that there would be more room, more space for um, interaction and exchange between our societies. One of the things that makes me sad, and I've had the opportunity to um, travel to Iran, and many of my friends and colleagues haven't, um, it's so clear to me that there is a yearning uh, for exchange, for interaction uh, between Iranians and Americans in all different fields, not just the political and economic, scientific field, um, uh, cultural field, for sure, uh, you name it. Um, and that would be my greatest hope, is more people-to-people -people exchange, interaction, uh, and hopefully there would be some space open to pursue that. We hope so. Um, Ali, would you like to continue uh, and paint your picture of a post-sanctions Iran-U.S. relationship? Um, well, I don't have my crystal ball shot, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I think one thing I would like to see, you know, it, it's sort of like Omid was saying about how Ronnie made a lot of big promises about human rights, but is for the moment, um, put, all his, put all his apples in the nuclear basket. And I think that's to a great extent true about Obama. You know, Obama talked very loftily about U.S. principles abroad, and we haven't always seen that in his foreign policy. There's been a lot more um, cold calculation, which might just be a result of what happens when we actually get into power and have to make these decisions. One thing Obama did do early on was support the mandate of uh, Ahmed Shahid, the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Iran, and, and Susan and Omid can probably speak more eloquently to, to his role on human rights in Iran and what it's been. But from my perspective, he's been a very uh, good advocate for human rights activists inside Iran within international fora. 
And so, I mean, I think that's the type of thing that should be pursued more vigorously by the U.S. You know, the, there, there are options for more pressure in other arenas, truly targeted sanctions, not these quote-unquote targeted sanctions that are much broader, but truly targeted sanctions against human rights violators and putting pressure on, on uh, the government there to, to uh, as Omid said, free political prisoners, to end the crackdowns on the press. And, uh, and help create a, a more open society by working at the margins to, to stop the government from doing these terrible things to its own people. So, I mean, that's what I'd like to see from, uh, from the U.S. Iran after the nuclear issue is resolved. Certainly very interesting considerations. Uh, we can only hope that resolving the nuclear issue could actually uh, result in a shift like that with regards to our foreign policy. Um, I think it's very interesting to think of sanctions or the possibility of sanctions theoretically as a tool for human rights as opposed to a um, something that's causing an exacerbated human rights uh, situation. Our policymakers could see them that way. <laughs> I would love to continue with uh, Suzanne and then Omid to close with your uh, view of the future. Um, well, I think um, all along sort of the tensions with Iran and tensions with Iran, at least on the U.S. side, have been coupled with this language of support for human rights and civil society, right? Um, and I, I just want to point to something. I, I wrote several of my friends in Iran and asked them what they think about this deal. And one of the civil society activists wrote me back, and he's actually a, a, a civil society activist. He's Kurdish as well. He said, you know, it's important to um, recognize that um, the, a lot of people have seen the issue of human rights and sanctions as separate issues, but they really are, some, they, they really are very connected and they're one and the same issue. You can't talk about people's ability to make a living or not, you know, not make a living or not have access to health care, et cetera, without talking about human rights. So, you know, he's looking very much forward to that. I'm also, I think the immediate resolve to the future and thing that I'm looking for is really lifting the sanctions and relieving some of this pressure, you know, um, whether it's economic, whether it's humanitarian medicine on the um, Iranian public. But um, beyond that, I hope that um, the state, I mean, I hope that um, the Rouhani government gave enough power to really be able to open up space for civil society activism. He's done that. The, his government has done that to some degree. Um, and so um, that's that's something that I hope for. And I think a lot of my colleagues have also said that to them it's important that um, they have this space where they can organize. They're nervous about, um, they're excited about engagement, but they're also nervous about engagement. They want to have engagement, but they don't want to have a similar situation such as, for example, uh, many of the countries in the region where you have the, the companies moving in and you have you know, the negative mm -hmm. um, results of that happening, or you have a civil society that's completely dependent on full funding. Or, you know, so those are the things that, that they're apprehensive about. But, they, but the fact that they recognize this and they want to be involved and they want to have a voice in this, I think is um, important. I'd like to see, I mean, I'm American and I'm also Iranian, so for me, Having relations between my two countries is something that, that I haven't um, experienced for 35 years. So I think for me that, that that would be something very positive. And I think there are a lot of Iranian Americans um, that would welcome that. And um, yes, so and and and, and really to, to foster that kind of understanding that um, that Suzanne um, talked about. But I also want to point to the fact that Iran is a big player in the Middle East. Um, and so I think that this formalization of relations might create an environment in the Middle East that's, um, um, that's um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a sort of conflict-ridden environment. It's a very problematic environment where all the players can come together and um, have um, logical, peaceful negotiations about how to tackle the issues and problems in the Middle East. So my hope is that if relations with Iran and the West and the West specifically improves that that would also help improve relations um, between Iran and its neighbors. Um, and you know, my hope also is that the international community continues to push not only Iran, but all the other countries in the region, which are, are the U.S. allies, which have uh, abhorrent records in human rights, to respect human rights, to uh, respect the autonomy of society, to make, implement serious reforms for um, democracy. So my hope really is not, it goes far beyond just the U.S. and Iran, but 
the entire system and how we can move the region to a peaceful future that um, respects the human rights. Thank you, Susan. This is a, a, a very um, beautiful vision for the future, so we can, we can hope to move in that direction. And um, Omid, I'd like to give you the last uh, couple minutes to just tell us, I know you're very connected to folks on the ground there in Iran, um, and I, I wonder what do you hope for them should uh, relations with Iran be normalized? We're not getting your audio. Uh, I hope for the removal of sanctions um, as soon as possible because it really impacts us. Mm -hmm. like, uh, the Iranians, I think, take sanctions very personal. Uh, they cannot differentiate that the sanctions are allegedly designed to harm their government, and as it's not, um, it hurts people more. Um, I feel like the U.S. Uh, is against the uh, Iranian people. Um, it's, it's very much the same narrative that the Iranian government promotes. Something maybe nobody in Washington maybe supports. Nobody wants to hurt Iranian people, or they uh, or, or explain that. So engagement with the U.S. and the world would make the anti-American sentiment promoted by the Iranian um, state, uh, uh, which has been promoted by, for the, more than three decades, uh, irrelevant. And that is uh, itself um, that itself bring uh, so much change to Iran, both uh, domestically and internationally. And this is a really that's a major component of uh, the deal. Um, and let's keep in mind that uh, Iran is one of the only countries in the Middle East uh, with positive sentiment uh, towards the U.S. And the deal will empower that narrative enormously. Mm -hmm. um, it's good for the security of, the, security of Iran, for the region and the world. And uh, the more international community values human rights at that point, the more they help open up the state inside Iran, the more people will, will be able to question government policies publicly, and the more accountable they will, they, they, they will be, uh, um, both domestically and internationally. So mm -hmm. I think it has, it's going to have a huge impact of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, huge impact in Iran in the coming months and years. All right. Well, thank you all for those uh, hopes for the future. And I just want to say I'm hearing that this diplomacy at all levels, so uh, perhaps once we get a normalized relations with Iran at the political level, we should all remember, um, those of you watching, uh, whether, whatever space you occupy, whether you're a business person, uh, an artist, within, as Susan mentioned, the cultural, scientific, academic spheres, there's always the possibility for diplomacy. So um, that's the closing note that I would like to end on. What I'm taking away is really that we should each think about ways that should this deal be finalized, which we hope for, and sanctions lifted, that we think about how we each can help to restore diplomatic relations uh, between our societies at the social level, between individuals and average people in the U.S. and Iran. So thank you all for being here. It was a very interesting discussion, and perhaps we'll have to check in in a few months down the road, and uh, hopefully we'll have positive news to report. So we'll certainly be following you, and we'll be happy to share your, your work in the ongoing months. And uh, Susan, if you send me that brief on what the public is thinking uh, we'll, about sanctions, we'll certainly uh, share it. And uh, again, I want to thank you each for being here. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, it's a pleasure. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.